and they, they sent me a number of tunes and I selected five and, and wrote this suite. And um, at that time there was a regular program on radio, um, classical guitar, I think, and um, Peter Sensi I mean, the, was the um, anchor man. And uh, when he was interviewing them, they said it, it's uh, impossible to believe that he had never been in Greece. In fact, it was another, oh, a long time, another, um, 1984 before I went to Greece, another 16 years after um, that was written. My favourite piece, I think maybe the first song cycle I wrote for guitar and voice, five quiet songs, and those get those have been performed all over the world. I think in 1989 I heard them performed in, in many places, including my birthday concert in in the, in the Bolivar Hall in London. If we go back to late 1934, the year in which I got my first guitar, which I still have, we have been played by many people, including Julian Bremen and Presley. Nobody knew, really, general public, if they knew of a guitarist, it was Segovia. That was it. The guitar was something you played purely as an amateur. Nobody ever thought of making a profession of it. The post-war years, 40s and 50s mainly, was a great time for the arts of all kinds because people had had enough of, um, of war, people dropping bombs and shooting one another and were looking for something more productive to do with their lives.
At that time, of course, Segovia was emerging on um, LPs. And skiffle was uh, abound, skiffle music. The guitars were spreading <laughs> spreading like a rash all over the place. People playing them in bed sits and um, all, over, all over the surface of the earth. In fact, demand exceeded uh, supply for, for some years. Um, this gave a, a, a big market for the instrument. And uh, this, together with, um, with Segovia's ambition to establish the guitar in, in tertiary musical establishments where it had never been seen before, its possibility of making some sort of a career now encouraged more people to take it seriously. And of course, inevitably, standards rose. They're still, in a sense, rising, technically. Um, you know, people are breaking all sorts of, of, of barriers for speed and fluency. Um, and they're, they're, many people have now a level of technique which Segovia never had. The ability to make a left hand look like water flowing down, you know, down, down a slope. It's not performing action in one place to another, it just flows, like pouring water down the fingerboard. There are many guitarists who have this now, who have a velocity and a facility that Segovia never ever had, even in his youth. Um, it's bound to happen. Nothing stands still. Um, the only trouble in, in many cases is the glorification of technique. Nobody ever tells them about music.
I realised that playing the guitar was like playing any other instrument. It was um, bringing t the best way of bringing two artefacts together. Um, a human being is an artefact, and certainly a guitar is, you know, all man-made. I tell people, for instance, in a class, I am potentially rather interested in what you play. I'm also interested, maybe more interested, in how you play it. <laughs> And um, I found um, I found in the most unexpected places that <clears throat> that people and with very good teachers that people have forgotten the basics. <laughs> I never hesitate to take anybody back to the ground if necessary. There was um, a very very good guitarist in Venezuela called Ruben Riera, <laughs> and um, Ruben was doing very very well in in Caracas. He had a, a nice apartment. He had a big, big American car. He could get concerts when he liked for hundreds of dollars, which was big money to them. One morning, figuratively speaking, he woke up and he thought, well, this is all very well, but where am I? What am I? I must find out. So he sold everything up and pr presented himself on my doorstep, unannounced. And he come to, to get my opinion, this playing. So when, when he played, I said, well, Ruben, um, musically, what you're doing at the moment is rubbish. Technically, you have to, you have to go back to the drawing board, square one. <laughs> Instead of uh, thinking, that's oh, silly old bugger, what's he doing? <laughs> you know, what does he know about it? OK, thank you very much for your opinion. Good morning. No, he did it. And he stuck with it. And he, he's... Um, He's one of the very dry ends of a guitar in Venezuela now. But um, you never know how people will turn out. My best pieces are always written very quickly. Um, I don't know why, but I suspect it's something to do with um, with how the brain works. In fact, I often tell this to, pe to students. In memorising a piece, don't sit in front of it and, and worrying it until you wish the, the, comp the composer's parents had been sterile. Um, Work on it for a certain length of time, two, three weeks at most, then put it away and forget it. Wherever you're up to, forget it. Leave it for the same length of time and come back to it. And you'll find you play it better and remember it better than you did when you put it away. Because you're, it's like dripping water onto a sponge. If you pour water on the sponge, it doesn't necessarily saturate it. Some of it runs off. If you drip it onto a sponge, and for a certain amount, let it soak in, you will saturate the sponge.
I had an incredible experience then, um, I think it would be about 1955. I started writing a piece and I came to one place and it was like meeting a brick wall. And I couldn't go past that place. Nothing I did. I tried all sorts of methods to get past it. Failed. Finally abandoned the idea. This is, going to be, this is junk. Finished. Unfinished. And that time, the house one mile from here, I, I wrote my music on a, a desk I'd made from, you know, from a Dexian and hardboard and stuff on casters so I could wheel it anywhere. Wheel it to the window for daylight, wheel it to the piano, wheel it anywhere into another room. And I was doing something, um, and under, uh, under, on the shelf under the desk, uh, I kept scrap manuscript paper for scribbling and making trials on. And then... Um, one afternoon, I don't uh, uh, now, now I don't know what what it was. I was doing something. I was typing something in the next room, and I went into the front into the room, the music room, and um, to check on something. I don't know what it was. No idea. It, it was nothing to do with the, with pieces or writing. Maybe looking up a date. I never I never did it. It was as though somebody took me by the shoulder, sat me down at the, the desk, and then um, I ferreted around amongst the scrap paper and pulled this piece out. And when I got up, I'd finished it. I had abandoned it, but my subconscious hadn't abandoned it. I now could not tell you where that point was. Segovia was was it, you know, who was the greatest guitarist in the world? Segovia, of course. Who was the second greatest? I don't know. I don't know anyone else. So Segovia and what Segovia did were the guitar. But Segovia was a romantic Spaniard. He had a, a fixed um, range. He didn't like anything that couldn't have been written what should we say, after 1920. And everybody was playing the same thing, everybody peddling the Segovia repertory, to the point where a friend of mine and I um, invented the International Interchangeable Guitar Program. Don't buy a program for the concert. Buy a, a well-produced, stout, long-lived um, international program, take it to every concert. It would begin with pieces by either Devise in D minor or Zantz in D. <laughs> it would progress to Dowland, <laughs> progress to Saw, any one of three works. <laughs> and it would go Albanis, Granadas, um, any one of three works each or two works each. Um, you can only put up with this for so, so long. <laughs>
Some years ago, Julian Bream played a concert in the Wigmore Hall on Sunday afternoon. First half of programme, Villa Lobos, uh, all 12 studies. Second half, first performance of World Winter Music. On the afternoon, Julian started with the World Winter Music. Afterwards, I said to him, you change the order of your programme. I suspect that you played it in that order because you knew if you played Villa Lobos first, half your audience would go home. Well, he said that's exactly what I did. And this was, uh, this was um, so symptomatic. Julian once said to me, he said, I think I uh, and, and uh, other people on my level have not done enough to, uh, to acclimatise people to new repertory. I said, I agree on the whole, but you it couldn't be levelled at you. You've done more than anybody else to introduce new repertory. <laughs> number of principles in teaching. One is that teaching is a two-way process. The teacher who emerges from a lesson not having learnt something is not a teacher. It's a two-way process. It's not God handing out holy tablets. And the second is what is important, why is more important. Don't tell people do this without saying why, explaining it. And I, I used to tell students, you know, private students, I said, if I ever tell you to do something, uh, not why, um, remind me. I've just, I've just forgotten to do it. I suppose I, I, I think and work differently from most, most guitar teachers um, because I've never ever been a performer, not, not on a classic guitar, never ever done it. 
um, never wanted to do. 